Well, thank you for coming to the session. Uh, we're talking about devil in the details, equipped in franchisees to be top performers. And I have some great franchisors here on stage. Want to start with introductions, and then we'll get into a few questions. One thing that's really important for me is when I'm asking these questions and they're answering, anytime you guys have a question and want to interact and jump in, please do so. I'd much prefer this to be a conversation rather than just us speaking to you about things um, because we might not hit quite what you're looking for on that specific topic. So with that being said, I'd like to start over here with Marty. And if you can introduce yourself and we'll go down the line and we'll get started. Sure, we'll keep the introduction short and sweet. I'm Marty Farrell with a company called Philly Pretzel Factory. We're based right out here in uh, Philadelphia. About a, yes, there's Philly people, hey. good. Hey. Those of you who are not from Philadelphia, welcome to Philadelphia. Uh, we are about 160, 165 uh, stores open right now, uh, celebrating our 25th year in business. It's our 25th anniversary this year. Uh, and I will just encourage also, what Charles just said, you know, hopefully you came into the room thinking about something specific. Right, some kind of challenge, some kind of operational issue, some kind of franchise relationship issue, something that sort of maybe is sticking a little bit, you need some help with, just think about that thing and ask that question, whatever it might be. Um, hopefully we can help you. I know the rest of the panel definitely can help you. I'll do my best to try as well. So good morning and welcome again. Good morning, everybody. I'm Mary Thompson. I'm Chief Operating Officer of Neighborly. We are the world's largest home services company with uh, 31 brands as of today all in the repair, maintain, and enhance space. Something, if you have something happening in your home, we probably have a brand that can do that. I also happen to be a licensed plumber, so if you have any plumbing questions, <laughs> I can help you with that as well. And some of you who are here as emerging franchisors, you might be saying, what on earth is somebody who has, a, we will do about four and a half billion this year in retail sales, and what is somebody doing here at an emerging conference? We are very, um, we do a lot of acquisitions, and uh, we usually acquire companies when they're at the emerging stage, about to be at the established stage. So at any given time, 20 to 30% of our brands are in the emerging space, and we think it's a very important you're either emerging or established or mature. We have brands in all three of those spaces. I came into franchising as a franchisee first. I was in a company called Cookies by Design. So what that means as a licensed plumber and a cookie person is I can make the best cookie you ever ate and I can fix your toilet, but I won't do them at the same time. <laughs> and so uh, this, this subject is very near and dear to my heart because it is at the heart of everything that we do in franchising. And so I hope you'll ask lots of questions and uh, more than happy to share our, our experiences. Plumber and a cookie, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Now, you guys know me. I mean, uh, I'll tell you my social security number is 24, because I told you my whole story earlier. But uh, Shannon Hudson, nine round. And uh, you're buying. Do you want to buy a nine round too, Mary? Uh, you never know. <laughs> no, no. But you guys know me, Shannon Hudson. Honored to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. And I'm uh, Charles Kaiser. I'm a franchisee. I've been in franchising since 2005 with my brother here in the crowd, Jesse. Um, quick story. Little Caesars was our legacy brand. Uh, we had that from 05 all the way till 21, sold it. Um, been a Valpac franchisee, currently uh, 27 sport clips, and we own OxyFresh Carpet Cleaning of the entire St. Louis market. And we were in a joint venture uh, with some medical spas with Ideal Image. So um, when, I, when I put this list of questions together, I think it's important for you guys to know you know, people always talk about what's important to them. And it kind of rang true when I was writing out these questions. As a franchisee, these questions were important to me, to a franchisor. So this would be coming from that perspective. Before we get going into the questions, what I'd like to do, because we're talking about top performers, and what I'd like to do is kind of set the stage for how franchising has evolved um, over the last 20 some years. and it's different and a lot of things have happened and there's some changes and I think that will really set the stage on what needs to be talked about moving forward uh, to have successful franchisees. So we'll just start right in the middle with Mary. If you'd like to um, kind of set the stage about what has changed in franchising over your time in the space. Well, I'm gonna be just a little contradictory. I'm gonna start with what hasn't changed. This is my 30th year in franchising and I came in, I was a franchisee 
The single most important thing in franchising is the relationship. The minute you have to pull the contract out, you're in trouble. And so, and it was in, in uh, 93, and as much as it is today in 23, uh, that, that relationship. And that relationship should be built on culture. Uh, you know, our last speaker just talked about that, about culture eats, eats a strategy for breakfast every single day, and it absolutely does. And um, as a company, uh, those of you who might know Neighborly uh, may know that two weeks ago our CEO unexpectedly passed away. Uh, literally in the early mornings of the hour, early uh, hours of the morning. And um, what got us through it wasn't our great plan, which we do have a great plan. It wasn't our great people. We do have great people. It was our culture. And if you're not thinking about culture and doing culture and paying attention to it, start right now. If, if you have not one location open, first and foremost, focus on culture. And there are some real-world things you can do that I'm sure we'll talk about here. Um, that is what that relationship is what will grow you, sustain you, and make your brand a relevant and important brand. Now, what has changed from what I've seen is the rate of change. Goodness gracious, I would like one hour that we don't have something that we're changing. <laughs> one hour, whether it's the marketplace or how the consumer is uh, looking and seeing us to how they're buying things, the rate of change just continues to get faster and faster, which brings me back to what I started with. You can sustain and keep up with the rate of change if you have the right culture and the right relationship, which is built on trust. If you don't, uh, I think there should be required reading for every single franchisor that ever decides to be a franchise, which is Stephen mm. Covey's The Speed of Trust. If you haven't read it, you need to read it. You should have everybody in your organization read it. We have all our business coaches. Uh, it's a required reading for our business coaches, and we teach to it. And I'll, I'll end with, you know, like what, if you have this rate of change that's happening so fast and you're needing to build trust, there are four pillars to that credibility. And Stephen Covey talks about it. It's, it's integrity. And it's not just meaning what you say and saying what you mean. And I've heard a number of people on stage talk about it. It's being congruent in all parts. Uh, if you see anybody with a neighborly pin on and you don't see a congruency to everything we do, which is our vision to be so remarkable we become a beloved household name, then we're, we're breaking the integrity side. There's intention. It's not just stating your intentions. Uh, you hear a lot of people talk about uh, transparency, but it's being able to say two things. And I have sat in dozens of franchise advisory council meetings where I have franchise owners that are spitting mad about something maybe even something that w is our fault. And I start with this. I want you to know two things. I seek your greatest good, and I mean you no harm. Do you feel the same way? Once two parties can say that, you can go anywhere, and you can build trust from anywhere. Uh, remember, we buy companies, and so a lot of times they're really scared when we buy them. And then the third pillar is is on the credibility is um, do you have the capabilities? Do you have the right people? Do you have the right talent? Are you growing your talent? I think the thing our our CEO, Mike Bidwell, most taught me is who I am today, I better be 10 times that person tomorrow. I better be growing and learning, and I better be making sure I'm doing that with my team and my franchise owners. And then lastly is the results. And sometimes you don't get the results right every single time, but you, to me, everything you should be looking at the results is what is going to benefit our franchise owners, what's going to help them grow, what's going to help them make more money, what's going to make their life easier. So uh, to me, that's what's changed. Fantastic. Okay, drop the mic. You guys can go home. <laughs> that, I mean, that's it. Killed it. Can I touch on one thing there? Yeah, of course. That was really good. <laughs> um, that's all I got. When, um, when she mentioned the relationship, I'll tell you how to close stores. I can tell you how to open them. I can tell you how to close them. I can tell you how to support them. And I know you can too. No communication and low sales equals franchises are like teeth if you ignore them they'll go away if you have to communicate with your franchisees and we have these non-responders right everybody has them in their says your system grows you know just the sheer size of it you probably have them too the non-responders i tell my team i said i don't care if you got to go drive over there and find them don't be creepy but Use every alternate email you can find, every alternate phone number you can find, and you gotta, I want you to reach out every single day. Follow up with an email, but reach out every single day. And some people today are scared to call people. They just email and text. And I'm like, 
pick up the phone and call. They need to hear tone. They need to hear voice. They need to hear that you care. You know, if you had a loved one dying in the hospital, they want to hear me, right? Would you agree? So that franchisee is a loved one, and they're dying because their cells are low. There's no communication. So you need to be calling. You need to try to get a hold of them and keep that communication tight, and that's how, that's how you get, get them on the, right, on the right track. Perfect, perfect. I mean, like I said, they're both uh, nailing it, obviously. I'll, I'll add something to the, the question, you know, what has changed the, the most in the last 20 years? Pretty obvious one is technology. Uh, and, and, you know, how we use technology, though, I think is probably, for us specifically, a, a little different now. Uh, mostly around the, the key performance indicators, really being able to give franchisees back the sales information. That really didn't happen. It happened 20 years ago, but it was a little longer to get the information, maybe date it when the franchisees got the information. Uh, so really using that information and having a culture, going back to the culture piece of, you know, obviously loving and caring about your franchisees, but also a culture of the financials, the numbers. Um, and what those are so franchisees can sort of know where exactly they stand within your system. And we didn't do this, again, even 10 years ago, uh, and now we have a, a very good system where franchisees know where they measure on a bunch of the key performance indicators that we measure, and that's probably one of the big shifts that, you know, internally we've made over the last several years. Have you ever had um, franchise owners that are like, I don't want you to put a list out because I'm not at the top of the list. Mm, Do y'all ever yeah. have that? Sure. <laughs> I, I think, you know, and I, again, for emerging brands especially, you probably will hear this in the beginning from franchisees. I would encourage you, uh, hopefully it says it in your FDD that you're allowed to do this. I guarantee it will in your franchise agreement should. Uh, but, you know, you have to push through that and, and kind of get them comfortable with sharing the numbers. And in the beginning, they were very uncomfortable with it um, and still are to a certain extent, to be honest with you, uh, some of them especially. Uh, but what we, you know, we, we create our awards around the, the sales performances, you know, the Diamond Club, the stores that do over a million dollars. Oh, I want to get into that category. They know the franchisees that are in that category. They look up to those franchisees. So now it's more of a, a culture of understanding the numbers numbers and where you stand, and if you're one at the low, low level, and sometimes, quite frankly, some of the franchisees who might be in the lower level of sales or performance, sometimes could be your most vocal franchisees also, and now they kind of lose a little bit of credibility. You know, the, the, the million dollar stores, the higher performance stores sort of should, at that point, have more credibility than somebody who is underperforming in your system. So having that transparency helps kind of quiet some of that down as well. That was one of my biggest lessons when I went from franchisee to the franchisor side, because I'd go to conventions and there'd be people talking, I do this and I do that, but I didn't know where they stood mm -hmm. in the numbers. Mm -hmm. And then I got to the corporate headquarters and realized where they stood. I'm like, why was I listening to that person? <laughs> and we do our franchise owners a disservice. By the way, in Neighborly, we call our franchisees franchise owners because we want them to know they have ownership. We want our team to know that they have ownership and we want all of us to be focused on that ownership. But um, when you start publishing those numbers, what happens is it gives a transparency and an insight to those franchise owners that they know who they should be talking to. You don't have to say a word. And if I ever have a franchise owner says, you're making me look bad, I say, no, I'm not. I'm just reporting what actually is happening. That's all we're doing to give insight. Yep. One thing on the sales. The sa if you have a convention yet or an annual meeting or anything, uh, sales awards, we do those at convention. And, um, you know, every 50,000 in annual sales, we're giving these awards. And, I mean, and we're pumping them through like a, like a high school graduation. John Smith, you know. And, and the point is, everybody wants to, to know where they are in the sales, where they stand. But it really opens their eyes when they see someone do a massive amount of sales that they didn't think was possible. And I love highlighting that and, and, and giving out a crap ton of awards at conventions. So if you have a conference, give out a lot of awards and try to make them very tangible, measurable awards, not just feel-good awards like, like sales or a net promoter score or, you know, reviews or whatever it is. But, but on the sales thing and transparency of the thing, she was telling me just a while ago before we started, back in 20 years ago, 30 years ago, they didn't talk about AUV 30 years ago, right? No, it, it wasn't. It, part of it was because they didn't have the data like we do now. Uh, and part of it, I, I still remember the first IFA convention I went to, I asked, like, are your franchisees profitable? And they're like, well, I don't know. maybe they are, maybe they're not. And so that's been a good change I've seen with yep. the data. Data inspires transformation. Yep. And so you got to use that data to do that. Love it.
Charles, one quick question. Just as a, a sense of the room for us a little bit up here, by show of hands, if you have like zero to 15 stores operating right now in that neighborhood, real emerging, anybody? So a decent amount of the group, okay. 15 to 50 in that group somewhere in that neighborhood, okay. And above 50, decent amount, okay. All right, just so we get a sense of where we're going. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. That actually segues into the next question, and it is about culture. And, you know, the challenge that I've always had with that question, tell, tell me about culture when I go to a conference is, you know, culture is non-tangible, right? It's like service. But somehow we figured out how to put KPIs around service. In culture, can the panel, can you guys talk to how you measure it? And then, especially for, um, for this room, I think there's probably some opportunities that as you start to put your culture together, you decide you want it to change. You want it to be different. So some details on if you find that the culture is not what you're looking for, how, how do you actually implement a change to change that culture? Because that can be a challenging thing. We can start. Marty here? Sure. Uh, I'll try. Neighborly is the culture <laughs> god, so I'm sure she's got a lot to add. So I'll just go. Better I'm going first, actually. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the culture that we have and what we're trying to do uh, at the company. Uh, I think, you know, obviously caring about franchisees. We all should be in that business, right? Caring. They, they're investing a lot of money into our business, uh, trusting us to, you know, with some cases their life savings, you know, really to make sure we take that serious. And we talk about that internally and understand that the commitment we're making. Uh, I mean, we have a set of core values that we go by. Uh, you know, something we call it's an acronym called Own It. Um, Own It itself could be a core value, but Own It stands for opportunity driven. We're going to always be focused on opportunities. W stands for sort of winning attitude, uh, but really not just sort of like this winning attitude, really winning attitude, meaning being positive, focused on franchisees, doing things the right way, sort of that winning attitude. Never satisfied is the N in Own It, never satisfied with our performance. How can we improve? What are the changes we need to make? Constantly evaluating what we're doing. Uh, the I in Own It stands for integrity first. We have to have integrity, we have to be honest, we have to, the franchisees have to think about us that way. Um, and then the T in own it stands for thankful. Again, thankful for the franchisees, thankful for the, the uh, vendors, thankful for the employees uh, that help us build and grow the brand. So that's sort of our core values that we talk about that hopefully resonates in the corporate office, that resonates out to our franchisees, that resonates out to the employees, that hopefully customers feel that as well. So, so when you think about culture, uh, especially those of you who are just starting off, I think there's two places you really want to focus on, and you can absolutely measure it. I'm going to show you and tell you exactly how we do it. First thing is, what do you do every single day to bring your culture into your business? So we, we also have one called Live Rich, which stands for respect, integrity, customer focus, and my favorite one, having fun in the process, or if you're a Canadian, fun in the process. Um, and hey. under, Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And underneath that, there are 15 values. Any time uh, three or more of our neighborly associates or team members or franchise owners meet, we recite our values. Uh, sometimes we do all 15 of them, and it takes 61 seconds because I've timed it. It really doesn't take very long if we're starting a meeting. Sometimes we pick one out that we really focus on, and when we operationalized our values, we wanted to have something that could be measured or something that was highly understandable. Like my personal favorite value that we have is operating in a responsible manner above the line because everyone knows what above the line means. It, does, it, mean, it doesn't just mean what the contract said. It's the spirit and intent of doing the right thing. So if we were all up here, we might start off with we live our code of values by treating others who like to be treated, and then we would go, we live our code of values by listening with intent to understand what is being said and acknowledging that what is said is important to the speaker. And yes, I have those memorized because I say them four or five times every single day, or we bring one out. We, sometimes I'll uh, have a tough conversation with a franchise owner. And what will happen when you're emerging, you're, everyone is just in love, and you're in the honeymoon stage, and, and you'll know the exact day you're not in this honeymoon stage, because you're going to have your first really rough conversation, and you have to have something to fall back on and talk about. And so like one of ours is communicating honestly and with purpose, which I really appreciate that, that purposeful, honest communication. And one of ours is listening with the intent to understand what is being said and acknowledging that what is said is important to the speaker. 
not listening with the intent to reply, which I have spent years working on, years. And I once had a group of my franchise owners that said, you're not listening with the intent to understand. And it gave them the language to come back to me as a leader and help me be better for them. So how do you measure it? Because that's the question, all right? You can measure it. And we use Franchise Business Review, and some of you who are emerging, you might just not be able to afford that yet. But they do a survey. Um, part of their survey is free, and I encourage you to participate with them. We have a survey strategy. We survey our franchise owners twice a year, no matter what, and we are maniacal about it because we want to understand where we stand in their eyes and how we understand how we do. And what we do is we take two of our values and we ask them, how are we doing? And then we report back to them the value that we scored the lowest in. We tell them that we scored the lowest in and we walk through what we need to do, what we think we need to do to get better. We meet with our franchise advisory councils and ask them, and it comes back to that. And then lastly, um, when, you're, when you're looking at culture and measuring, we added a question, and, and if you say, oh man, I can't have FBR, I can't afford this FBR thing, you survey monkey to start with. Have a strategy, don't do it haphazardly, let them know why you're doing it and what you're gonna do about it. We asked, uh, if you've ever read Fred Reichelt's the, um, uh, Net Promoter Score, says, you know everything about your business if you ask one question. Yep. On, a, on a scale of zero to 10, how likely are you to refer us to friends and family? We tweaked that with our, for our franchise owners and we said, on a scale of zero to 10, how has your business coach helped you grow your business? And every coach we have has a number. And we rank them, we t show them where they rank, uh, we take the top 10%, we use them as trainers and we learn from them and bring them in and have special sessions with them to learn what they're doing that we could be bringing across all our business coaches, the ones that are at the bottom, we coach them and work with them to get them improved. That number is a very meaningful number and it tells them that we care and, it sh and we share it with them. <laughs> that was great. I, <laughs> I wish I... <laughs> anyway, um, I think you're hearing from both of them, uh, you know, values, mission, you know, mission, MVV, mission, vision, values. So I, I want to stress to you how important it is to nail that right, to get that correctly. Um, there's, a, there's an award out there called the Malcolm Baldridge Award. I don't I know you're probably familiar with it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's called the Malcolm Baldridge Award. It's given by the President of the United States. It's the highest business award you can possibly get. And my organization went through the Malcolm Baldridge process and to win the Malcolm Baldridge Award, you have to win the state level first. You have your, at your state in South Carolina, it's called the Governor Award, and we, we, we got third, third place or whatever. We didn't get the Governor Award yet, but, so we're still working on it. But one of their big things is uh, what these guys are talking about, mission, vision, values, and how do, you, how do you make sure that happens throughout your organization. One of our, one of our values is Kaizen. Kaizen, you might have heard Toyota coin Kaizen. It's, it's always improving. So that means always improving. And our franchise business coaches are always talking. They start out their conversation with franchisees is, have we, are we practicing Kaizen today? Besides getting on this call, what, what else have we done? Have you worked out today? Have you, you know, did you sleep well last night? Did you drink the water today? You know, so my coaches are always doing that. And I totally forgot what the original question was. Um, <laughs> so, because um, um, you actually were touching on it downstairs oh, uh, during your talk. Um, so I think something that would be really important is to talk about if you realize you wake up one day that your culture needs oh. to change. Like, what are, what's the hard steps that got to happen to make that change? Yeah, it, start, it starts at the top with you. It starts with, you know, you have to lead yourself first before you can ever lead anyone else. So it always starts with you. And, and I, I think when I go into that home office especially, I'm on stage every single day and I've got to be, you know, I'm the one who sets the tone for that culture, right? And I have to bring the positivity and bring the energy, bring the light in the eyes, the pep and the step. So for you to change culture, it, you know, it starts right there at the top with you and it always trickles downhill. So make sure it's, you're the one setting the culture that you want. For, for example, our culture at our office is very, as you probably know, guess what it is? Guess what it is? It's high energy. It's all, everybody's high five and fist bumping. They're working out all the time. It's just part of our culture. They do it, you know? Um, so it starts with the top and it just permeates down. And so to fix a culture problem, 
you know, it, it's got to start from the very, very top and, and move downward that way. And, but but I, I would strongly recommend work on your mission, vision, values. Get them tight, tight as you can. Every word has a price. Make, make it as... Most companies, I bet you, if I asked this hotel staff member what the mission statement, statement is, I bet they don't know it. Yeah. Because it's too long, it doesn't have any meaning behind it. My, ours is, mine's on the bracelet, on this little bracelet. Stronger in 30 minutes. That's what we do. We make people strong in 30 minutes. Mentally, physically, every, that, that's it. And every staff member knows it. Every franchisee knows it. Everybody can say it. So I strongly recommend to get the culture right. Start with your MVV, mission, vision, values. Start with the top and work from there. You know, one of the things you mentioned was it starts about starting at the top. When we first put our, our, our operational values in place, it was like just at 30 years ago. And the leaders put it together. And, okay, it's great that the leaders have it, but what does everyone else think? And so they went out to the group and they said, this is what we think should be our culture here for this company. And you can watch us. And if you see us making a mistake, you mm -hmm. can beep us. I still get beeped about once a month uh, because, like everyone else, we're all human. And I wake up every morning excited about you know, living those values. And I go to bed every night knowing I've broken at least three of them. One of them is speaking calmly and respectfully without profanity or sarcasm. <laughs> and uh, I, I was a Marine. I was in the Marine Corps. So I had to re work really, really hard at that one. Um, but letting people hold you accountable to those values at the highest level that's a wonderful way to change the culture and show them that yeah. you really mean it. Now, beep you. You mean like beep? Beep. They actually go beep. beep. Uh, one of ours is responding in a timely fashion. <laughs> and I was in a meeting, and I hadn't answered someone's email. And I said, we got to get back on that. Someone goes, beep. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's a good reminder. Allowing, you can't hold anyone accountable if you're not willing to let others hold you accountable. Awesome. Any questions on that? So the next question is related to um, fran new franchisee onboarding. So mm -hmm. what does franchise training look like for the new franchisees coming in? Uh, and can you, can you lean in on just how important that is to set the trajectory to their tenure? You're sorry, me? Okay. Yeah. Um, I, it's, remember, remember that my organization, I'll tell you, 95% of our franchisees have never owned a business before, ever, right? So, so not only have they never owned a business, it's a franchise business. So there's a lot of complexities here that, and a learning curve that has to happen for our people. And a lot of it is business 101. And I, I feel, you know, I know the first part of a relationship is like an infancy. They're in the infancy, right? They're like a baby. When you have a newborn, what do you do? I mean, you got to coddle that baby and take care of that baby and feed the baby and, you know, and, and burp the baby and all that stuff. And thank God I don't have any more babies, right? But uh, physical babies, franchisee babies. But, but so, so the onboarding process is so, 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 so important. And I would, and here's what I recommend you do. Whenever a franchisee comes on board, signs the line and pays, it's scary for them. Would you agree? Yes. You, I mean, I just sent off thousands of dollars to this, to the ether. It's a Faguzi. It's a Wazi. It's a, you know, just mm -hmm. and sign this big old thing like a mortgage for 10 years. It's scary. So guess what? First call is from me. Me. And, I, and it served me very well over the years saying, hey, thank you so much. I'm very excited to work with you, yada, 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 and we have the conversation. And what that does, it alleviates some of the buyer's remorse. Everybody has buyer's remorse when you buy something, especially that big. It's, it's scary. And then they get the shock and all box in the mail. You know what the shock and all box is? It's a box of a just shit ton of stuff. It's cuss. Beep, sorry. Speaking uh, calmly and respectfully. So, so it's... A big box of goodies, man. Boxing gloves, shirts, hats, swag. You know, you know. and now I'm okay. Okay, they're like, "Ooh, this is cool. This is cool, right?" And then, of course, the training process, which you want to know, right? You want to train. How do you get these guys up and running, right? So, using tech, online mo training modules, the best way to do. The best way to go. Having them do the online trainings, you know, it takes a lot of work to set that up, but it's so worth it. 
So by the time they come to the physical training in Greenville, South Carolina, they, they've already get, gotten so much knowledge from the online versions and talking to their franchise business coach. They've already got some smarts to them. They're there. They do five days with us. And then when they open, we have a home office rep. Notice I say home office, not corporate. Corporate sounds so cold, right? Corporate. You know, so the home office a team member comes out for a kickstart. Get it? Kick kickboxing, kickstart visit, and spends a couple of days with them there. Um, so, so that's how we onboard them. It's, a, it's usually, you know, a nine, six, nine-month process because real estate process is the slowest, can be the slowest piece. I know for us, so we do have a brick and mortar, and sometimes that's challenging, but it's a six- to nine-month process. Uh, I'll just add a little bit to that. I think the one thing for us that we've realized, especially we're talking about the onboarding process for a new franchisee, uh, very intimidating for a new franchisee. I just signed this check, like you said, and now what do I do? You know, it, it's very important that if you, especially if you're emerging and you're starting, you kind of think about every step that it's going to take to open a store. And we've written out every single step or, you know, or open a business if it's not a brick and mortar place and write it down and end the order that those things should be done so you have an actual process that you're following with that franchisee. So as soon as the franchisee signs the franchise agreement, they immediately are starting to work in our world with the real estate department because we gotta find real estate for them. And then there's a whole process for that. Here's all the steps we need to do to get the real estate. Here's all the steps for the construction. Here's the operations piece of it. Here's all the things you're responsible for, Mr. Franchisee, because they still, you know, they're working on building the business and opening the store. That's when the franchise part starts. You know, they got to, you know, and that's the part they're probably most uncomfortable with uh, because they haven't done some of that stuff in the past. You have a, just, again, my advice would be having a very detailed checklist of exactly, uh, and it's automated and it's, you know, it's sent out to the franchisees and you're reviewing it with them on a regular cadence. Ours is weekly. Uh, with that new franchisee as well. So that would be my one advice. So if you have a checklist and you have Frank Connect, they have a really good checklist that also emails out when uh, deadlines are missed to both the business coach and the franchise owner and anybody else within your system that you'd want to. So we see new, we see training in five parts. The first part is before they ever become a franchise owner, when they come to meet the team day or whatever you call your orientation or your um, your discovery day, it starts with that very, very first set of words and first what you're doing. We talk about our values. We talk about how our expectations. We tell them that there, when you think about in business, there's a coaching relationship or a nursing relationship. Nurse says, I'm sorry, you don't feel well. Sit down, put your feet up. The coach says, I know you don't feel well. You got to run 10 more laps. We, we start by telling them you're, we're going to be in a coaching relationship with you. So <clears throat> that's the first step. And then you touched on it about... Um, the, the next step is before you come to in-person training because we have varying levels of, of um, capabilities. And so we want to make sure everyone shows up on the in-person training with some similar and ready to go. So we do uh, pre-training. We call it phase one. <clears throat> and then we do the hands-on in-person training, which is critical because that also starts really building the relationship and building the trust. Uh, and then we have post-in-person um, training uh, that requires... A lot of um, a lot of the uh, online training. One of the things mistakes we made in our online training is we'd have these hour-long online sessions. If it's more than nine minutes, it's probably too long. You've lost their attention. So we had to really take our online training and put it into little chunks. And all of that is tied to this checklist. And then the fifth one is ongoing training, whether it's webinars, regional meetings, conferences. Um, performance groups, and we, we tell them up front when they come in, this, this is how your training is going to look. And, you sh and then lastly, we wrap that all in <clears throat> with a position that we call Sure Start um, Business Coach. And that person's job for that franchise owner is usually for six months. Sometimes it takes three, sometimes six, sometimes nine. It depends on the brand, and it depends on the franchise owner, frankly. And their, their mission is to get that person from having signed their contract all the way to open successfully, uh, generating revenue, and starting to really dig down on their unit level economics. And we want to have, we, in that position, um, I'll tell you the mistake we made. When we first started doing that, and it was probably about 14 years ago, we took the newest business coaches and made them the Sure Start coach. I don't know why we did it, but we did. What we've learned over the years is you're very 
best business coach has to be. And so we've elevated that position. It's a slightly higher than a business coach because we need the very best business coach in that, in that role because how they get started, if you look at where you want, you know, when I, I look at where I want their royalties to be, which is, of course, where I want their sales to be. I want them to be here. But if I have a business coach that's mediocre, they end up here at the end of that 10 years. But if I have a business coach that can lift them just that much, that trajectory takes them to here. So that's what, that's what we do. Yep. That's great. Um, you know, <laughs> so when you're talking about the analogy of the, the nurse versus the coach, it kind of reminds me, um, you know, an, another way to kind of put that is, uh, especially I think when you're training and working with your business coaches, the franchisees are going to have challenges. It's their first business. Um, and so <coughs> it's important to make sure that you have empathy, but not sympathy. Uh, sympathy is disabling. Empathy is empowerment. And um, you want to be empathetic to their concerns. It's new. It's, it's stressful. But being empathetic means we say, I understand that. Now here's our course of change of action. Here's how we move forward. And if a coach isn't properly taught that, um, it's possible unintentionally they become sympathetic. And that will um, they'll be crippling to your franchisee, in my opinion. Tough love. Give them tough love, right? Yeah, you have that. Yeah. Um, here's a question. How, as a, as a franchisor, how do you balance franchisee innovation with brand standards? Um, start with Shannon. We'll yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Franchisees always give you the answer. It's so crazy. I mean, I mean well, here, here's what I do. I, when I see franchisee doing you doing something different, and, I, and and where we catch them is social media, right? You guys yeah. catch them on social, and which I love social because it gives me like just eyes into what's happening in that store. I mean, you can see kind of energy level, culture if the club's clean, if they're doing the the the, the prescribed workout. You know, you can see everything on there, right? But you don't want to say that's where you caught it, right? Because then they'll quit posting on social. And that, that's the worst thing in the world. You don't want that. So when I see a franchisee with like a new piece of equipment, this happens for us, I go, wow, man. And, I, and then I just set, let it sit and I see if more people will use it and I find it more and more and more. And then I, then I go, man, and then we'll put out a survey. What, you know, and this is uh, optics, right? Even though I probably, you know, I have great intuition. I think that's my business superpower. I'm not great at anything else pretty much. You know, I can tell some good dad jokes, but... Business intuition is kind of my thing. I kind of know what equipment pieces will, like, let's use equipment, for example, because I said that, what will work. I kind of know intuitively what will kind of work, what can be the next thing. And we'll go ahead and tell franchisees, hey, submit your, submit what you think you would like to see in the brand. Submit what pieces of equipment, new pieces of equipment you'd like to see. Or submit what t-shirt design you like, or submit whatever. Even though I kind of know the answer, I do it anyway and let them have that voice. I let the Franchise Advisor Council have that voice. And, and even though I think I know, sometimes I'm wrong, not much but on, on that piece, but it gives franchisees a, you know, a place to, to say their concern, to say what they want. And so when I see it happening out there, we'll ask them what piece of equipment you want. And sure enough, that piece will come through. And hey, let's, let's add, that, add that into the, into the program and we'll put it in there. So. We learn from just seeing franchisees do it because it's so easy to, to, to bring in pieces of equipment or try a different marketing service or try, it's so easy. You're gonna have this out there all the time, rogueness. It's, you know, how easy is it for your system, for your franchisee to be rogue? That's a great question for you and your team. How easy is it? And if it's fairly easy, you gotta keep good eyes on it, but you're gonna learn a lot from your franchisees about what works and what resonates with them and what resonates with their members, and you listen to that. And for us, we own, one of the things we do that's unique, I don't know if how unique it is, but we own all the, the uh, product that's inside that location. So every boxing glove, every punching bag, everything, we, we source it, we make sure the branding's right, we, and we have it, and we pick, pack, and ship to the franchisees. So I'd be silly if I didn't take that piece of equipment that was out there working and go ahead and develop it and sell it to the system, right? And so, so then the, so the franchise, so my point in all that big long story is the franchisees will give you the answers if you just watch and pay attention 
and then ask them what they want and then see if it works for your brand. That's how we do it. And let me add on to that just a little bit. Um, Cliff Hudson gave a great example where, um, the, on the ice cream. So at the very top levels, you need to be listening, but also there's so much to listen to. Mm. So how do you know what to listen to? And uh, I'm an operations girl, which means I'm really, I'm not very intuitive. I like the numbers to tell me what I need to be doing. And so we believe in testing small and testing fast. Mm. When we see something that we think is smart, we go out and test it and get as, and, and sometimes data is hard to get, but we work really hard, we're very maniacal about getting that data to understand what did it do for that business? Does it increase the profitability? Does it add something over here? Does it make it easier for the service professionals that are out there? Whatever, what, what does winning look like? And so when we know that and we get the data from that, then it helps us make stronger and better decisions on what we're going to do there. And then the second thing I would, I would recommend to you is, um, and this is, I ask, I'm going to ask you this question, and I struggle with this myself. What are your non-negotiables? And, you know, our, our purpose, our, our, our mission is to build a service community that enriches people's lives by delivering amazing experiences. And we, uh, and if it can't roll off your tongue, you really don't have a purpose or a mission. I love your bracelet. Love it, love it, love it. Um, so... We ask ourselves, does it fulfill that mission? Is it part of that mission, or is it taking us off our mission? Because that's the very first question. And then what are our non-negotiables that we know we absolutely have to do that we're not going to bend on? And then if it's, if it's outside the non-negotiables, and we have clear data that shows us that it improves something in the business, because um, there's a book by Dr. Francis Fry called Just Four Things, and it's four things that businesses do that create really strong businesses. One of them is to have the courage to say no to things, is to have the courage. You know, we are home services. We used to have an accounting franchise, and we, it's the only company we ever divested. It was a great company, but it wasn't within what we did. And so ask yourself, um, if the data doesn't show you that it's a, it's a marked improvement, does it take you off your task? Does it take the franchise owner off what they're doing? Hey, can, I, can I speak on the testing real quick? The way we, we've turned our culture and system around is through that fast testing, test small, test fast. We, 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 run, we are running pilots all the time. I mean, are you guys doing that too? I mean, we're all, we, we had three pilots this, this year going at the same time with you know, with a lot of franchise units trying different things to figure this thing out. And, and so, so test fast and small, like you said, is, is awesome. Yeah, and is it better to have a brilliant idea that eh, kind of gets implemented or to have a good idea that you're at 95% on? Mm. I'll take the good idea that we're at 95% on any, any day of the week. And I can talk to any franchise owner and say, this is brilliant over here, but it's we need to have the courage to say no so that we can be really great right here. Yep. I'll just add something real quick on the, the whole innovation conversation around the franchisees. Have a process again for them to submit their ideas. Mm. So if they have to go through a little work, here's what my idea is, here's what I think it's gonna do, here's how it changes the brand or the system, they have to write it down. Quite frankly, sometimes they stop and don't go that far because they, they thought it through a little bit. Uh, but if they really are committed or think this is something that can change the brand or change their store or change the system, they're going to go and put a little bit more work into it. So having a process for them to submit ideas around whether it's product initiatives, marketing initiatives, or anything, training initiatives, give, give us to it in, in a, in a well-thought-out format, and then we can have a conversation. Having a conversation in a store with a franchisee where he says, oh, or he or she says, I think we should do this. That's really not innovative, right? We're not getting anywhere with that conversation. I almost tell them, don't give me those ideas because that's not what I'm here for because let's put it in writing if you want to uh, you know, really work through some kind of initiative you want to implement. So. Awesome. So we have about 12 minutes left. Um, I've got one question left before I get into a couple questions I think are going to be really important on unit level economics. So if one person would like to answer this, that would be great. Advisory, Franchise Advisory Council, should you have it? And if so, at what stage of your brand should you uh, implement that? Um, it's, better to have them here. Okay. <laughs> it's an easy answer. Yes and now. <laughs> right? Uh, you're off now, I think. Did you run out of battery? Just grab the other mic. Just grab the other mic. Now, 
How about now? Yeah. Yeah, the, the answer is yes. My only hesitation was the now on how big your system is. You know, if you have three units, I mean, maybe they all are, they are the Franchise Advisory Council. Right? So we right, just right, started right. Lawn Pride. We have okay. five units. We have an advisory council. Boom. Uh, and the reason for that is um, you have got to start getting franchise owner input, yep. engagement. If, if someone's engaged, they have to believe two things. They have to believe tomorrow will be bigger than today, and they have to know that they get to be part of it. The way you do that is through an advisory council. So I would, I would say as soon yep. as you can. Are you guys writing all this down? <laughs> I think what she's getting to and what I've learned in 15 years is the better you can marry the partnership between franchisees and home office. I mean, marry it like this. See, see two, it's so easy. You've got to be careful to get like this. Like, and that happened to us. And it's hard to get back, let me tell you. So you got to get it like this. So having that advisory council that's like part of you too, part of the home office, and the better you can do that, so yes and now, yes. Yes and now. Yes and now. All right. <laughs> All right, so unit level economics. P&Ls, do you guys require the franchisees um, to submit P&Ls? And if you do, uh, what do you do with the data? I'll start. Uh, the answer is, do we require, for, the question is, do we require franchisees to submit P&Ls? The answer is yes, it's in the franchise agreement. Do we do a great job getting the P&Ls? To be honest with you, no. Uh, you know, a lot of it, and we're, it's, it's, it's a problem. We should be doing a better job doing this. And I would advise all of you, especially if you're not, you're young and you're starting, to start right away with getting actual P&Ls from franchisees, sharing all that data and information. Um, mostly, you know, P&Ls become a little bit of triage. You know, that's when we're getting them, right? When, hey, I'm looking at numbers and I'm struggling, you know, the franchise business coach is reviewing those things with them. Uh, but we should have a better system in place. Uh, what we are able to do with the data and with technology, we are able to back into what we believe is a P&L through the KPIs, through all the information, through everything we get. But it's not 100% accurate in terms of getting actual P&Ls from franchisees. We can request them at any time and get them from a franchisee, but we don't have a, a system, but I do rec recommend, and I'm sure Mary does already have a system in place to get them, so I'll let her talk. Well, we've been exactly where you are. Yep. I, I would love to say, oh yeah, we collected them every single time. So there's two things. There's one thing that you can do right now that I'd recommend. No franchise owner is going to give you their P&L if you're not giving them an assessment of what it means and how they rank against the rest. And when I was a franchisee, I remember my franchisor asking me to send it, and I sent it because I'm compliant. And I sent it, and I never got anything back. And a couple years later, I stopped sending them because I wasn't getting anything. And they were a great franchisor, but they weren't doing that. And frankly, neither were we at Neighborly. Well, um, <clears throat> so first thing we did was start having our business coaches do really specific roundouts with the P&L. And to be able to have, you know, you got to have benchmarks. How do you apply to the benchmark? And just putting a simple Excel spreadsheet together that says, if you were at the benchmark, this is how much more money you'd have. And let's, let's take this out five years and show you, because there's only three things you can do with your profit. Pay yourself, which you need to do, because if you don't, you don't get your ROI or you go away. Pay down debt, because if you don't pay it down, they're going to take it away from you and put it back in the business, because if you don't put it back in the business, your business will die a slow, ugly death. So we, we start with that, and we talk, and the Sure Start coach starts with them on that. The second thing we did is we do have a platform called QVinci that overlays on QBO, and I really like it because um, sometimes there are two things that happen. We will get P&Ls in, even though we have a chart of accounts and we want them to do it a certain way, their accountant doesn't want to do it that way, or they don't want to do it that way, and it maps the chart of accounts to your chart of accounts. So you have an apples to apples comparison. The second thing that platform does is we, they can compare themselves to the region, to, them, to the brand nationally. If two franchise owners send us in writing, yes, I want to share P&Ls, they can see each other's P&Ls. When we put performance groups together, they can see their P&Ls compared to one another. And that transparency um, of data uh, really uh, generates that transformation that we need them to do. And so I, I really like that. It also has uh, cool features where you can, and I'm sure there's other platforms, so I'm not trying to sell you on this platform, but there are platforms that do this, where if I'm trying to control, in our business, fuel costs are very expensive. So if I'm trying to control fuel costs, and I want to keep it under $4,000 in a month, 
I can put something on there that says, send me an email when it exceeds $4,000. Or if I know my cash flow break even is, is um, $12,000 a month, send me an email when I've hit my cash flow break even for the month, those type of things. And that makes them more likely to, to look at their P&Ls and share the information. And we have full insight. If they're on QVinci, our business coach can see everything into. Now, it was hard at first because they're like, I don't think I want you to see everything. They're very, it's very personal. Um, but you have to create the culture that you're not going to get anywhere. It's like going to a doctor, and I, I don't know about y'all, but I hate stepping on that scale every time I have to go to the doctor. I hate it. But he has to take my vitals so he can treat me properly. And so that's, that's how we approach it and talk about it. Yep. Awesome. Yep. That's what we call it, vitals, not KPA. We call it vitals because that's kind of how we yeah. relate it, vitals. Yeah, we don't require the P&L. You have to have the tech and the uh, people, people power, the bandwidth to do it, right? We haven't been very good at it. We can watch, we see gross sales all day, all day long. We see every membership sold, every dollar coming through the store. And we rank the stores A, B, C, D, you know, and everybody's trying to get to that A store. And, and we give franchisees, our coaches give them percentages. Where do you want your rent number to be compared to sales? What percent of that? Where do you want your labor number to be? What are your cost of goods? What's your advertising percent? And where should, where, let's get those numbers percentages in line. Let's drive sales to get those percentages in line. But we could do a better job on that, on that P&L thing. Everyone can. Yeah. <laughs> I've got time for one final question. And this is the one that I want to ask because over the last couple of years, this has been a topic and it can be a challenging topic. My question is, how, how do you handle um, pricing strategies within your brand um, that is higher or lower than your recommendations? So if a franchisee's not following the standard model, um, how do you guys handle that? Uh, well, first of all, it's really important that you have a pricing strategy. I would tell you for years we did not. And I would talk to franchise owners that very proudly would say, I haven't changed my prices in three years. My customers love me. <laughs> and, and the very next thing out of their other side of their mouth was, I'm not making as much money as I used to. And so having a process, uh, you remember, there's no such thing as motivation. Nobody, I don't wake up in the morning and go, yay, I can't wait to run those four miles. I put processes in my life that make me do those things that then make me the person I want to be, so I will be motivated. And it's the same thing with our franchise owners. And so you need to have a process in place that actually has them look at their pricing. For us, we do it twice a year. Uh, we just can't figure out how to do it faster or more often than that. That's just how it works for us. And the world of service is a little bit different. But secondly, um, if you can provide data to them, and we didn't, we've only been doing this part for the last year and a half. We brought on a business intelligence team, and we have them pull the data for the market based on close rates and based on different things uh, that are within their specific market. And then we show them where, the, where, to remember, where they might want to think about being. Now, remember, you have antitrust laws. You cannot say it will be this price. Right. Okay, you can't do that. You can only recommend and suggest. The best way if they're not doing it is to show them what it's costing them and show the next, so the next six months we say, if you had done this, this is what happened. And part of our pricing model is, even if you expect to lose this much business, some of our uh, franchise owners, like Molly made, their subscription, you know, nobody remembers what they paid for plumbing last time, but you remember that every single week or twice a month you pay this for, for a maid service. And so they get really nervous about that. And we, we showed them how, okay, if you lost these customers, but you gain these new customers that are spending more, and here's, you can actually provide a better set of service to your customers because you can have, you can pay your service professionals more as well. So that, that's how we've done it. Um, do we have any questions? Yes. Well, I could start there if you want. Um, uh, ideally, you want to transfer the business and get it resold, right? I mean, you don't want the unit to close, so you need to, it, it, it's really two choices. The franchisee, they either take the coaching well and, and the store starts to perform better, or you find a new buyer and, get, and they can gracefully exit, right, and move on. 
So that's the conversation that's challenging that you got to have with the franchisee. And the quicker you can get on that, the quicker you can nip things with these franchises that aren't performing, the better. I mean, you get in there quickly. And if you haven't, one thing I did incorrect, not well, is I didn't develop a resale program early. I got so caught up in high in the selling. I mean, we were, I mean, you saw that, you heard of the stack of franchise. I was like, yeah, ooh, yeah, we'll never close a store. You know, and then and, and all of a sudden people want to sell, and I'm like, oh my God, how do I sell? <laughs> I don't know. And resales are complex. They're complex because you got an asset purchase agreement you have between the buyer and the seller. You got the lease you have to get with the landlord correct. There's so many complexities to it. So if you haven't developed a resale process, or as they say in Canada, process. Mm -hmm. You need to get one now and be ready for it. And you need to be ready to transfer franchisees that aren't performing in your system well out gracefully, gracefully. Now, some people are going to have to leave because life circumstance too, you know, uh, death or, um, you know, marital divorce or whatever. But you just got to be ready. For, I wasn't ready for resales, you know, 10 years ago, but now we've got, we, we'll do 30 resales a year. And we do 30 a year. I mean, we've gotten really, really good at it. So that's a thing you've got to really tighten up on. So I apologize that we've ran out of time. If you have more questions, I can't speak for everyone up here, but if, if you have a few minutes to stick around to Absolutely. answer some questions, we'll definitely be. Our wonderful speakers. Yep. And as we go on to our next session, there'll be five different sessions. One will be here, four will be down on the second floor. So look for the topics in there. Yeah. Uh, I'm young. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, you guys are great. Thank you very much. Thank you all.